Well, staying with the topic of South African exchange-traded funds and exchange-traded notes, uh, we're taking a look at the, the, the universe that we have here in South Africa. Take us through the local ETF universe, Kobe. Yeah, and I mean, again, and I just want to substantiate what Mike said just now, this thing is changing on rapidly on a continuous basis. So it's very, very, if you're, if you're, an, if you're an investor and you want to understand the space, always make sure that you kind of look at the pages, go on to kind of, Mike runs a fantastic website called ETFSA, go and have a look at kind of just the various products that are available. Let's quickly show you quickly what those products look like. These are now what is called exchange traded funds and you could have a look at uh, the number of, that's available. Now I'm just going to leave that up for a little bit, but just have a look quickly there. If you want to be in the global markets, well guess what? You don't have to swap your money out the country anymore. You can get yourself Euro exposure, British exposure, Japanese exposure and various other countries by just literally buying the ETF here uh, that are onshore. Obviously you can't pick the companies, but you're going to be able to buy the index that will track the actual indices in those markets. If you want to be in fixed income, well there's a whole range of products that you could potentially choose from, as you can see on the other side of the screen. And if you just have a look at the number of market products that are available, you know, there's just a ton of those. They could be as specialized as something which we call New Rand, which gives you Rand hedge type qualities, and it could be as simple as potentially buying something like, for instance, the top 40. There's also two balanced ones that are available. That means they're buying you equities, bonds, and cash. And then obviously gold is a commodity ETF. Yeah. Um, if we move just quickly forward to the exchange traded note universe, just have a look at the number that is available. You look at commodities, platinum, palladium, silver, gold, oil, and the various other ones that you could potentially get your hands on. Markets, there's a couple of exchange traded notes available there as well. And then obviously currency exposure as well, if you wanted to say currency exposure as well. Let's just go back to the global markets there, because just looking at uh, the performance of the Euro stocks 50, that, uh, that ETF, I mean, it's down in negative territory on a five year basis. But if you look at it on a six month basis, up almost 43%. Mm. So if you've taken a position on Europe recovering, you're making good money. This is it explains the opportunity to get exposure offshore without actually taking your money offshore. Yes, you can actually manage your ETF portfolio to say, let me take advantage of where I think markets will be strong and, and all sectors of the market that'll be strong. So there's periods when you want to be in the bonds market and periods when you don't. And so you can run a portfolio by just allocating your portfolio amongst ETFs. And uh, because you're not buying one share, you're buying a whole portfolio of shares, this diversifies your risk because uh, there's less volatility in it. And it also creates a way in which you can bring your cost down because asset allocation unit trust portfolios and so on are very expensive. You know, the cost ratios are quite high. So increasingly we're finding, as Kubi was uh, showing there, there's so many different ETFs. The average investor, even the retail investor, typically owns four or five different ETFs and he's trying to pick a portfolio. And sometimes they get it right and sometimes they don't. And we're trying to educate people as best we can to do that. But that's where there's a big opportunity for the financial advisors and all the rest is to go out and say to people, well, let me pick a portfolio for you where we can buy some offshore ETFs, some local ETFs, some bond ETFs, maybe a little bit of gold, and put together a portfolio of four or five ETFs. And this can give you very good performance at very, at very low cost. So there's a potential to use all those different ETFs. They're not all there just to confuse people. They're there to help them in constructing and their own And of course, all in different yeah. asset classes, yeah. as you're saying. Well, that's a big issue, yes, is to spread your risk amongst different asset classes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a classic example of where I've seen ETFs being used, you know, phenomenally well, is where somebody has a long-term portfolio. So they've got a split between equities. They've maybe got a little bit of bonds. And if they don't have bonds, maybe there's income components, such as PREFs, for instance, that they own. And then there's a cash component obviously in it as well but now they need to get exposure to for instance the global market or they need to potentially take an exposure in a commodity or they want to pick up a little bit more rand hedge exposure now you could potentially go and look at each one of the companies and up weight and go and do the valuation but you know that means that you're gonna to have to now go and redo all the work here's a simple way to do it you okay. could potentially just go and buy one ETF, make sure that the allocation is right in your total portfolio construction, and quite frankly, there you go, you've got the exposure. Another way, if, you don't, if you're busy designing a long-term portfolio and you want to be in active stocks, but quite frankly, you just don't have any buying opportunities, but you, you want to be exposed to markets, buy the ETF. You quite frankly can get full market exposure, full market coverage, you're going to get the index return, so you're not going to get paid for any skill for doing it, but that gives you the ability to then slowly start taking money out of that and start allocating it to stocks and specifically ideas that you quite like. Let's talk about uh, exchange traded notes and exchange traded products, uh, funds rather. Exchange traded notes of course new to the South African market, we've also had those uh, currency exchange traded notes recently listed. How popular are those and just very quickly if you could just explain <laughs> the difference. Uh, they're becoming quite popular as people understand them. And ETN is quite a simple structure. It's really just a promissory note. It's a bank issues it and says, we promise to give you the total return of 
an asset or an index that we're tracking. And, uh, and they have that obligation to provide you that, that total return. And therefore, you have to look at the creditworthiness of who's issuing those, those notes. <coughs> the JSC but generally, <coughs> I mean, you know, big banks in South Africa. Yeah. It's only unlikely so that they're going to We only have the big four banks in South Africa issuing ETNs. So they're nice and simple, whereas an ETF is a, is a more complex structure. They physically have to hold the stock mm -hmm. of any shares or any assets. They have to have an independent trustee. They have to have all sorts of structures in there. So an ETN is a simple way of getting uh, exposure to, to asset classes. And I think it will become more popular because we're worldwide. Increasingly, people are saying we want to be in ETNs rather than ETFs. <coughs> But now the uh, ETFs are registered as a collective investment scheme. So therefore, as I said earlier, quite a lot of institutions can only invest in collective investment schemes or something that's regulated by the Financial Services Board. So we'll see a bit of both in South Why Africa. Why do they want to be listed, uh, exposed to ETNs over ETFs? Uh, basically because that's what their mandates say. I mean, over time, they might change that. But you know, it's very difficult to get a bunch of trustees at a pension fund to change their mandate. So some of them haven't even decided to invest in equities yet. They're too risky, you know. So, <laughs> so, uh, so, so that that takes time. But uh, the, the, both of them are available. But the big advantage of ETNs are flexible, and uh, it's much easier to get exposure to certain commodities. It's it's say you want an ETN that gives you exposure to wheat. It's very difficult to store wheat. <laughs> It goes off after a while, whereas you can actually get exposure to wheat by buying a futures contract. Yeah. So an ETN can do that. If you wanted to have a wheat ETF, you'd actually have to physically store the wheat in the chairman's car park or something like that. And of course, that's, that's impractical. So, so the practicalities of ETNs are a big advantage. Now let's, just, let's just quickly have a look at uh, the ways that you could potentially utilize ETFs and ETNs in order to kind of build a portfolio. If you have a look at the table on your screen, you'll see, um, you'll see that as a core portfolio, you're going to you can be a, you're able to pick up obviously share based expo exposure by kind of buying any of those over there. Now some of them are kind of sector specific, some of them are style specific, some of them are size specific. So you need to take all of those into consideration and obviously match those relative to your total objective. But then you've got diversifiers on the far right hand side of the sc screen. This is what you add onto your core portfolio. Property, for instance, you could go buy Govi, Ilby or Tracky. Those are all kind of or in, in inflation X. Those are either cash or bond type indices. Uh, that you could potentially track. And then as a satellite, well, quite frankly, there's a whole range of commodities that you could track, there's currencies you could track. And then obviously, and I sp we spoke about that quite a bit today, New Rand, which is uh, obviously tracking those kind of companies that are obviously based offshore. And then you see there's some of the other ones in New SA, New SA, and if, you, if you've got a green thumb and you're trying to be I've more green. I've got a green thumb, so I'm interested. Are there, is there a lot of interest in that? Be green, no. It's, uh, no, uh, it's, it's uh, which is amazing because worldwide you find that companies that are that are green, in other words, protect the environment and don't pollute the atmosphere, perform better than companies that don't do that. Basically, probably just because I've got more money. So an ex investing in an environmentally friendly green index is normally a very good investment. So you're right. Yet you've got to sell that to people here. You think, oh, green, that's you know, hanging bunnies and trees. So they must and go out there and support the environment. They should actually go and, and buy a B Green ETF. It's a very good performer. And, and I suppose B Green... it's not a bad idea at all in terms of investment strategy. And I, I suppose B Green is a, is, a, is a slightly misleading name because it's actually a green ETF, quite frankly, mm -hmm. but it's also socially responsible. So it's kind of a, yeah. a, 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 a combination of the two at the end Correct. of the 